Good morning, everyone. It is Monday, October 28th. I'm Juliette bennett Ryla here with John Weigel, and this is The Hustle Daily Show. Most of us have played Candy Crush or some other mobile game on our phones, right? That's common now, but it wasn't in 2003 when Nokia released its N-Gage phone to compete with Nintendo's Game Boy Advance. The N-Gage wasn't just a phone, but an MP3 player and a mobile console that allowed users to play games over cell and Bluetooth networks. It was a solid idea, yes, but a disastrous execution made this one a failure. We'll get into that in a moment, but first, here are today's hits and headlines in business and tech. Okay, starting off at the gas pump, Amazon Prime members are getting a new perk, roughly 10 cents per gallon off at participating BP, Amico, and AMPM locations. To enroll, Prime members must link their accounts to Earnify, which is BP's loyalty program. Gas, by the way, has actually been a pretty good deal lately. The average price for a gallon as of last week was $3.14, nearly the lowest it had been in three years. Moving on. In fact, moving on thousands of miles away from gas pumps. According to the Wall Street Journal, Boeing is considering selling its NASA business. The idea comes as Boeing struggles financially on a number of fronts, including most recently its inability to reach a deal with its largest labor union. That union strike has more or less halted Boeing's aircraft production in the last few weeks. Boeing's Starliner spacecraft, of course, was also in the news recently because it was stuck in space for nearly the entire summer and had to return without its astronauts. The Wall Street Journal described Boeing's plans for sale of its space business as pretty early stage and said that it's very possible that no deal will be reached. Boeing has been in the space business dating all the way back to the NASA Apollo programs. Next up, which is also according to the Wall Street Journal, federal prosecutors are investigating Tether, the most traded cryptocurrency in the world. They're looking into Tether for potential anti-money laundering violations. News of the investigation, which broke on Friday, led to a dip in value for many cryptocurrencies on Friday, including Bitcoin. Meanwhile, according to Business Insider, JP Morgan has been making waves in the investment banking industry by hiring new talent during this time of the year that is known as the banking off-season. These moves come as investment banks have seen their deal-making fees grow, but are dealing with uncertainty regarding interest rates and the upcoming presidential election. And finally, some Cybertruck news. Now that enough Q3 reports have filtered in over the last few weeks, we can gauge the divisive new Tesla vehicle's popularity against the crowd. And according to TechCrunch, the Cybertruck is very popular. In the third quarter, it had around 16,000 sales, which is more than any electric vehicle besides Tesla's Model 3 and the Model Y, also from Tesla. To judge exactly kind of how popular the Cybertruck has been, we can look at sales of the Ford F-150 Lightning. In the third quarter, Ford sold just 7,000 of that electric truck. As a result of this good news around the Cybertruck and its other models, Tesla shares were up to their highest level since September 2023 on Friday. Remember how marketing used to be? Content was simpler to create, leads were easier to capture, and we weren't all spread so thin. Bottom line, marketing used to be fun. But with HubSpot's newly launched marketing and content hubs, You'll generate better content, more leads, and next-level results, so marketing can be fun again. With tools like Content Remix to turn existing assets into all new pieces in just a click, lead scoring to shine a light on the leads most likely to purchase, and analytics suite to tackle out-of-the-box reports and KPIs with a goldmine of AI-powered insights, it's quick to get you results. It's easy to use, it connects all your teams and data, so put the fun back in your marketing funnel with HubSpot. Visit HubSpot.com to get started for free. So our main story of the day, mobile gaming is a huge market right now. So you'd think Nokia did a great job getting ahead of all that with the N-Gage, a 2003 device that pledged to combine gaming and phone into one. It really didn't make waves or a lot of money, and we'll tell you why. But Juliet, can we first talk about what this thing looked like? Yeah, so the N-Gage came out in October of 2003 and meant to be a competitor to the Game Boy Advance, which was Nintendo's handheld console. This thing, um, well, you know, it looked like a taco. (laughs) 
people called it the taco phone. Uh-huh. Kind of a hard shell taco, just to be clear. Right, right. Not floppy. Yeah, hard shell. Mm-hmm. Very flat, maybe kind of like a seashell, you know, that kind of shape. So much bigger than you would think of a normal phone or mm-hmm. at that time specifically, if you want to stick with Nokia, the brick phone that Nokia is famous for. Right. Much larger and more awkwardly shaped yes. than your traditional dumb phone at the time. It does, however, true to form, look a lot like a Game Boy Advance, which was approximately the same shape. Yeah. Also very (laughs) taco-ish. So at least they achieved what they wanted to achieve. Yeah. So in addition to looking like a taco, what could it do? What were its main capabilities? So it could do three things, three main things, pretty much. It was a phone. So anything you could do with a phone at the time, which was not much compared to today's (laughs) phones, but yeah. You could use it as a phone. It was also an MP3 player, very useful. And you could also play games with your friends over cell or Bluetooth networks. So kind of a three-in-one device and not a bad idea. Mobile games, big industry today, they're expected to generate $98.7 billion in 2024. So Nokia definitely had the right idea here. Yeah. The problem... The problem was that uh, it was shaped like a taco and uh, people made fun of it a lot because if you wanted to use it as a phone, you had to hold it up to your ear sideways. So instead of like being Uh, flat against your face, you're holding it out and you just you didn't look very cool. That sounds also kind of painful Mm -hmm. in addition. Yeah, I don't love it. Yeah. So it was just trying to do too much in one device for the technology I think that was available at the time. So let's say you're playing a game, but you want to play a different game. Well, you got to insert the game cartridge. But to do that, you had to take out the phone's battery. It wasn't just like, oh, I'm playing this game. I'm going to switch over to this game like today. It was it required all of these steps. Mm -hmm. And then if you wanted to use it as an MP3 player, you had to disassemble it again. And then there had to be a memory card that you would put in. And that wasn't included with the phone. So that was like an extra thing. And plus, it just wasn't that pleasant to game on. A lot of users found that the buttons were pretty clunky because, you know, it was also a phone. Right. So it had a lot going on. And then it kind of really didn't do any of those things well. I feel like what you said earlier, pretty fantastic idea in Mm -hmm. pretty early on in 2003 to make something that was capable of playing games and being able to call people. And the question, I guess, was at the time, how could any device be capable of doing that? And I guess the answer is it wasn't. (laughs) It's just you had to keep detaching, reattaching. It was kind of like a Transformers of phones Uh, where you had to kind of have these different necessary attachments for a different function. And how expensive was it? Was it like an expensive purchase? Yes. For its time, very. Uh, It retailed for about 300 bucks, which in today's money is $500. And that didn't include the games. Each game was a separate purchase. So you might as well just buy a Game Boy and have a dumb phone at this point, because at least they're going to work well. And less than a month after launch, they just weren't selling. A lot of retailers, including GameStop, chopped $100 off the price. But It didn't really matter because within two years, Nokia was like, you know what? This is not working. They tried to redesign it. That didn't work either. So they did continue to make games. They had an Engage gaming platform, which was actually active until 2009. Then they shuffled customers over to the OV app store. And um, that's Mm. also now defunct. But, you know, they had a great idea. You know what's a winner for Nokia? Snake. Snake was a solid game when that was all you could play. Big winner. When that was all you could play, Snake was great. Mm-hmm. It seems like also this Engage was the last kind of huge innovation in the Nokia sphere because mm-hmm. I very much remember during this time in the early 2000s, Nokia being the popular flip phone, kind mm-hmm. of making a name for itself in that sort of market in the phone market. But Nowadays, it's really interesting because as we've talked about on the podcast previously, Nokia in 2024, at least, is kind of making a bit of a weird dumb phone comeback. So maybe we'll see one of these again sometime soon. Right. It's such an interesting cycle to me because, you know, a lot of these products that we talk about were just ahead of their time or were coming out at a time where it very rapidly didn't make sense for them to exist. Right. Like the Twitter peak, it was like, okay, it's kind of like a phone, but it only does one thing. And it didn't do that one thing well. Why would anyone want a device that's just for Twitter? But that company, Peak, actually had some success with the device that only had email on it for people who wanted email on the go and didn't want to spend Mm -hmm. the money on a BlackBerry. Right. And that was a good idea, except rapidly the iPhone came around and everyone was like, well, I can just do everything on this. It's a phone. I can text. It's a calendar. It's a clock. I have games. I have the internet, you know. Mm -hmm. But I think what's happening is now our phones can do so much that it's a problem. <laughs> yeah. And people are finding themselves doom scrolling through the same six apps every day. So now they're like, you know what I miss? I miss my dumb phone. Yeah. I miss my phone 
that could tell me the time, make a phone call, text, end of list. So Right. Having separate devices for separate things. And, you know, I feel like we're seeing that coming back with Nokia a little bit. Also, these mm-hmm. kind of like small AI contraptions that are coming oh, yeah. out now, like the rabbit and uh, humane mm-hmm. AI pin. I feel like these are one trick-ish yeah. devices that are coming back and maybe pulling people away from their phones a little more, but it's going to be really hard to take people away from the smartphone. Humane's AI pin got terrible reviews. I haven't read too much about the rabbit yet. I just feel like it's going to take a lot for there to be a device that works well enough that people are like, yes, this is what I'm looking for. And also isn't cost prohibitive. Mm. I feel like most people are like, I still have to have the smartphone right. and I'm not going to spend an extra $700 on this other device. So we'll see. But you know, there are some people who are getting dumb phones because they're just like, yeah, I don't want all this crap on my phone. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah. I personally would be very interested to have a new version of the Nokia N-Gage. <laughs> I might buy it. A phone, gaming console. Yeah. Pretty great. It's like if my Switch could call people. Love that. Yeah, I think I would be maybe sold on a dumb phone, but it would have to have maps on it. Mm, maps. I can't key. do without maps. And like the app that tells me when the bus is coming. That's like the one thing I'm like, mm, I need this. <laughs> I need this. Yeah, transportation resources. Mm-hmm. Yeah, need to be had somewhere. That is very sure. Yeah, I don't need TikTok. I don't need Instagram, but I need yeah, maps. Just carry around that, you know, backpack from Dora and have the map <laughs> guy come out and give yeah. you your directions. Yeah. All right. And that'll do it for us today. Thanks for tuning into the Hustle Daily Show. We're a proud part of the HubSpot Podcast Network. Our editor today is Robert Hartwig and our executive producer is Darren Clark. We've got a lot more tech and business coverage in our newsletter. If you're not subscribed, go get yourself signed up at thehustle.co slash email and we'll see you later. If you're struggling to keep up with all the latest innovations in tech and what they'll mean for your life, TED Tech has you covered. Get ahead of the curve with digestible downloads on some of the biggest ideas in technology, from AI and virtual reality to clean tech. Find TED Tech wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, what's up, everybody? I've been listening to this awesome podcast lately. It's called Hustle and Flowchart, hosted by Joe Fear. And it's brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. The Hustle and Flowchart Podcast with Joe Fear is all about how to build a business so it gives you the freedom and fuel for your life. You can join Joe as he discusses systems, mindset tweaks, reframes, and strategies for entrepreneurs and really anyone, to be honest, to enjoy the process of being in business and also having fun. This isn't just for the entrepreneur looking to make a billion dollar business. But it's also for somebody who's looking to build systems that work for you so you can make more money than you need just by working part time, essentially. I was actually just listening to an episode he had on Kareen Walsh behind the app. Hey, Kareen. And Kareen talked a lot about how to scale your business effectively, especially if you're just a startup, especially if you are just an app startup specifically. It's an awesome episode. I would recommend it to anyone. You could check them out. And you can listen to the Hustle and Flow chart wherever you get your podcasts.